then any scene you should any scene you shoot should be a painting like ideally anybody should be able to pause a scene that you shot and every screen grab should look good granted that's not gonna happen you can't you can't get perfection every time but like that that should be the goal and of course coming back to what i said earlier that should fit in the context of the project whatever it may be all right so it's just they they both go hand in hand the goal is to like capture a moment Um, oh, that other ten much. Uh, I've I've just recently like really started taking a look at finances. Like, I mean, I've always like been looking at them, but like really taking a hard practical look at what like what a dollar costs. Um, and then kind of like translating that to how much I actually need to work. Um. I haven't made an like, actual, you know, five-year plan or wh whatever it might be called as of yet. But, you know, million dollars, I would say, I think my goal is definitely uh, a 440. And I think that's achievable. And all the, the amount of work, I'm 32 now. Be 33 in September, but I've gotten a couple of you know like goals that I thought about. I want to get a house for my dog before you know before his time is up, before he goes on to glory. And I never really cared about the idea of a house before, but it's like, man, I want to, I want, I want that, that that little dude to be able to like run outside. So I think all of those things kind of like line up with each other. So. Yeah, sometime in the next five to ten years, I would like to be uh, financially uh, independent. As in, I don't have to worry about money anymore. Now, I don't know if that necessarily constitutes to being a billionaire, but like, probably one and the same to me. Orange part on this stuff, right? Okay, okay. Start with the white part first. It's like when you're when you're cooking, and the instructions on the bag, you throw the bag away, and now you're looking in the trash again. <laughs> Every time. Uh, I think the older I get, like, the less that number is. Because I'm realizing, like, the things that I absolutely need versus the things I want. Y'all get me wanted that really nice car. But me now is very, very happy with my uh, Rev4 hybrid. Like, there's, there's not much else I need out of a car. Uh... I think the the goal for me is definitely just I want an amount of money where nothing in my life becomes an issue. I want to go on a vacation. Okay, I got the brand for that. Um, oh no, surprise surgery for for me or a loved one. Oh, okay, the bread is there for that. I have to retire. The bread is there for that. I don't know what that number necessarily constitutes to you. Today's age, I know it's getting higher and higher because of inflation, all these other things, but if I had to take a guess, it'd probably be like a net worth in the hundreds of thousands of dollars.
I'm nowhere near that yet, but I mean, that that feels like the right number. I was like think about like you know winning the lottery or like you know being younger you have a daydream of like running into a suitcase filled with money and like i know like it translates both ways because i was like 18 i was like damn i wish i found a suitcase on the side of the road with like five million dollars in it and now it's like hmm, i wish i found a suitcase on the side of the road with like maybe 50 grand in it right so like the, 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 the number of money just has become a lot more reasonable just because it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't, it matters, but like, it doesn't matter as much. I was like, we just, we always want things, but the things we need are always different. Either feels clean. Checking the bottom two are Doc Martens. Um, I don't know if there's like a specific model of boot, but I used to buy. I like wearing boots on a on a daily basis, just because they're usually pretty comfortable and they're durable, and I like going to work. My regular job, I'm in the studio, but every now and then I'm somewhere uh, shooting something. I could be in the woods, I could be like in the city, I could be doing something weird. So it's always nice to have like a trusty shoe that I can wear and I have to like worry about. I used to get them to Amazon for like pretty cheap. Ew. Yeah, I see what you mean about the water. <laughs> pretty cheap. And, you know, just wear those into the ground. But like after the third or fourth one, I was like, I would like a more reliable boot. And I just put money into these jobs and they've, they, you know, they've been, they've been thugging it out. <laughs> Checked out. The whole shiny boot theory uh, in praxis. And it makes sense. Drop you know, the money you would spend on uh, a couple of different different iterations of the same thing, or just one quality thing. And it's always, it, it usually always works out. But, you know, upfront costs are pretty difficult for uh, probably these. Can't think of another shoe or another boot. Maybe eventually getting a pair of Nike boots just for the culture, but like as far as like every everyday wear, I I really enjoy these. Oh, uh, then maybe some butters just to say I got them. Uh, I think it means to be a participant in the experience that the whole community is living uh, and in that sense to you know respect it and enjoy it at the same time I'd imagine it's a uh, more of a feeling than a thing that you can like kind of like bullet point out. Sorry, I don't talk a lot, so I had to rehydrate. <laughs> These guys have uh, been pretty reliable. There was a shoot I did where the talent 
just decided to step into some some water. It was like on a like a like a kind of like a, a waterfall display type of thing. Uh, I forget exactly where, but they stepped in the water. It made for like a really cool moment. And I was like, I gotta get closer. So I stepped in the water with them. And my my socks stayed dry and warm. As we all know, a cold so- a wet sock is top five <laughs> the worst experiences. So it was nice to know, you know, that there's a, a certain amount of reliability in the shoe you're wearing. Uh, sturdy. Uh, a certain amount of comfort because you've got to assume you're going to be wearing it all day. And longevity. You want to be able to wear this the boot for a very extended period of time. way to think about it I, I guess I would say yes in a very um, you know fractional way they've allowed me to do my job with more comfort so you can only assume that you know percentage of benefit does have some carryover So yeah, I'll say yeah. <laughs> I think as it stands now, I would like to be a cinematographer for sure. That is that is the job that I want. Or rather, that is the job that I do. And I would like to do that at a higher level uh, than what I'm doing now. What that means is, you know, getting involved with bigger productions um, uh, everywhere. I want to be able to shoot in a different country and I'm called upon because my skill set is uh, appreciation appreciated or wanted. And then I guess in tandem with that, I'd like to have my own production studio. So somewhere that I would call a home base or home office. I think those two things in tandem would be would be the uh, culmination of my dream in a sense or as I see it now of course you know things evolve things change but I think for sure those two those two things are where I see the trajectory of the things that I'm doing now Should I give it another, another pass? Does it feel different being the subject rather than the, uh, the shooter? Oh yeah, definitely. I think that's why I'm so focused on this task is because I'm trying to <laughs> distract myself from it. But for sure, there's things that I'm always worried about on set uh, that, you know, I kind of just got to turn off to answer the questions and, you know, do the actual thing, which is to clean the shoe. Yeah, I guess your mind is always going in a couple of different places when you're shooting. You want to make sure everything's tight. You want to make sure everything's recording. You want to make sure everything is lit. Um, depending on what kind of shoot it is, you got to 
make sure the talent is taken care of, all, all those different things. So it, in, in a sense, it's nice to be on the other end because I can just turn my brain off. <laughs> But I think fortunately I've been around cameras and people in front of cameras so much that I don't actually feel as nervous as I thought I would feel uh, being recorded. So that's, no, that's a plus. Most notable shoot I've been a part of. In these shoes. I've typically worn these like 90% of the shoots I've had since I've got them. I have to go down the catalog. I gotta make sure if I remember if I did wear these on that shoot or not. Um, I did a shoot relatively recently in Brooklyn, and this this is for my actual nine to five job. And that that shoot in itself is notable notable because it is the first shoot in which the way that. The, the contract is set up. I, I should, in theory, receive ro royalties for the shoot, right? So it's a shoot in where I, in tandem with other people at my job and the copywriter, you know, we came together and brought a particular vision to life. It's still being worked on. It's essentially like a documentary, but came to life, uh, and then once it's completed and it goes out into the market, there is a, I should be getting royalties on it. So that is no to me because it is, I mean, I'm, not, I'm always profiting off of a shoot unless, you know, it's like a, a love project, but this is one where it's like, oh, the, my actual input is being rewarded on a large level. And I think, I think that's pretty notable. But I consider myself as in terms of, or in terms of the production world, is cinematographer primarily. Of course, I do all the other things, as you know, it's the, the nature of the beast uh, with the way things go. But I think it was last year, or maybe the one before that, where I was like, no, cinematographer <laughs> is the job that I actually enjoy the most and what I would classify myself as in terms of the industry because capturing the image especially capturing the image in terms of what the project needs because it's one thing to shoot something that looks really cool but it's also another thing to shoot something that speaks to whatever the project is and I think I have a knack for that um, so cinematographer I think I could be a director but That, that requires a skill set in terms of the communication that I'm not necessarily the best at, or I, I would not put that over the skills I have as far as cinematography. I edit, but it doesn't bring me joy. In fact, editing <laughs> does the opposite. <laughs> so I am not an editor because I know that for, because I know people that call themselves editors enjoy the experience of editing. That's, that's not me. Uh, and I'm not a producer. I can't bring projects together. I can do things, but the way my brain works is it it's not meticulous enough to be a world class <laughs> producer. So I think the way, the way my brain works, I know I can become a world class cinematographer, and that's where I'm going to put you know my experience, skill points, <laughs> so you know what what, what have you. Uh, what would be my greatest skill set in terms of one to three based on the things that we just talked about. So 
in my opinion, a one for uh, cinematography. I'm fully aware that, the, you know, the world is large. Um, but this one to three is relative to the other, to, to the other skill sets. Uh, so one for cinematography. I give myself a three for producing. Um, I give myself a two for directing. Just because I can communicate what's 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 needed, because uh, cinematography and directing go hand in hand. One is verbalizing whatever the the context of the project or the mission is, and then the other is visualizing it. So there's there's you know there's some synchronicity between the two, but directing is a very um, specialized task. That's why when you like look at the industry, it's like yeah, this kind of director, you have this kind of director. And they're extremely different, but they both make, you know, beautiful projects. Um, whereas with cinematography, it's like, you don't really have this out, you know, these outliers in terms of cinematography. Of course, there's different approaches, different tactics, but the, the goal is the same. So it's uh, less, um, I don't want to say you unique than directing but it's, it's different um, in terms of editing one to three I, I would say I, I would say a two two maybe three just because the beginning is fun for me you know putting the footage together coloring the footage doing all that and in the end, when you get to like past 95%, you're like, oh, I'm almost there. But like that 5% to that 95%, it just sometimes it's just torture. Even if it's like really fun stuff you shot, like it just, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's laborious, <laughs> especially if, you know, it's hours and hours of footage that you got to, condense into like something meaningful in like eight to ten minutes, you know. The scales vary or whatever. But yeah, so like the only one I would feel confident in saying one cinematography. But all the uh, but I know where my weaknesses are in the actual skill. Those are things I of course have to like work on. So I would say one relative to everything else, but in the, you know, the grand scope that I have a long way to go and it's, it's always going to be a journey. You can never be like, Oh, I'm, I'm great at this. Then, then, then you've lost. <laughs> what does cinematography mean? Uh, what does cinematography mean? Um, just thought at the practical level, it is capturing the moving image for a unit project, commercial, short film, feature like film, documentary, um, uh, from, you know, from, a, uh, I guess a more emotional level. It is using all the tools available to you um, to really capture the essence of, you know, a project that is shared. Because usually as a cinematographer, the projects come to you. And not to say, you know, like, you can't have your own thing, but usually you're hired. Or usually a director comes to you or a producer comes to you. So these people trust you to bring their vision to life. So it's, it's a matter of using your innate abilities, using your technical abilities to literally visualize somebody's project, dream, baby, what have you.
let's bang it around this time. I think that's what knocked all the dirt off. Well, and I guess in my limited experience, science work with a great director are that they can really get to the heart of the matter um, and concisely say what they need to say to anybody involved in the project. Because what you would say to actor A as a great director, it's going to be different to what you would say to actor B or to this person or that person, whoever is involved on the set. They know how to, uh, it's kind of like a, like a quarterback or a point guard. They know who needs to go where, what they need to do and how to get the ball to them. And, and I guess in my eyes is what a great director does. I need to be able to make the vision clear to everybody involved. Whereas, you know, somebody that's not as great, I'll just tell everybody the same thing. But you can't do that because what's the, the expression? You can't judge how great a fish is by how well it climbs a tree. You got to be able to put terms into perspective for everybody. to give that to us thought. So the question being, how much does the ins and outs of how would affect my final take on pay? Um, that's a good question. I think my first hand experience was like Hollywood knowledge is very limited because all the sets or the majority of the sets I've worked on have either been in the context of my job, which is a corporate, you know, corporate production gig or my own stuff, which is small production creative gigs, right? I music videos, small scale documentaries, interviews, things like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard for me to conceptualize the carry over there, but I mean, I would say like, I have to be realistic about like rates. So if cinematographer A in the industry is charging this daily for this level of work, for this level of budget. Those are things I would extrapolate and try to apply to like, you know, what I would charge or what, what a pro what go is like involved in the budget of a project. But of course those things, you know, can be very different. You know, look at a, a feature, a feature fell, the prices there, they get, you know, the budgets get fucking crazy. Spending like thousands of dollars on craft services just to feed you know because it's usually like an army of people so it's hard to like make that carry over because it's, it's apples and oranges because me on my own or like the people I work with are typically handling jobs on set together that would be individualized on larger sets so I guess, yeah, all of that goes into account how much you charge, but you know, also want to be fair. Um, but again, that's why I, I give myself a three as a producer because sometimes I, I don't even want to think about those things. Sometimes I just want to shoot <laughs> and then just kind of let those things be. But I'm at a point where it's like, no, if I want to get 
to where I want to go. Those, all of those things had to be considered. What does it mean to let the creators create? Uh, I think what, what that means is trust. Uh, people get hired by people because they like what they've done. So to let a creator create is you got to trust that they are doing their best also in the best interest of you. Because I don't think as a creator, it, it should be your mission to create things that are honest to you, but you also have to create things that are honest to the project. Because if you don't, then you're being selfish. Because uh, when, I, when I think about like the industry, especially on those larger projects, there's not actually one particular thing that sets a great project out. Like a great movie isn't a great movie because of this, 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 or this. A great movie is a great movie because everything came together so beautifully. Like one of my favorite um, cinematographers, his name is Roger Deakins. And one of his quotes is, if you noticed my work, then I've done a bad job. And that is to say, like, if you watched a movie of his and it said, oh, the cinematography is beautiful, then it's taken away from what the actual story is. That's to say, like, you should be doing your work. And you're always, you know, trying your best, but in terms of what is actually being crafted. Because production, media, all of this stuff, all of it is, it's a team effort. There's no, like, one man, one man band, unless, unless it is. You got vloggers and things like that, yeah, but, like, the world I want to live in is movies, documentaries. There's no one person that makes the project. Everybody comes together and does a thing. Uh, so, question being. Uh, what does it mean to let a creator create is it's a sense of trust on both sides that like I'm doing what's best for me but also what's best for the project because you know we all have things that are like I like the way this looks better but if it doesn't fit the project don't do it and make the thing that should work or the thing that's best for the project you know make it your own or whatever spin on it you can but you have to realize that you got to fit the paradigm of what you're doing with everybody instead of trying to, you know, show off, I guess. These are, I'm pretty sure it's the pro phone positive. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a sneaker hit per se. <laughs> But they are phone positives for sure. Um, for uh, being from the DMV and owning a pair just means that you were involved in a uh, a moment of time, I guess. I can't remember the exact years. I don't remember the exact years that uh they were really huge. But I do remember that time, you know, everybody had a pair. Um, but it was just, you know, being a part of that experience. Uh, unfortunately for some people, it also meant getting robbed for your phones. <laughs> um, I think when I got the, I got these, a friend of a friend had essentially a thrift store, you know, one of them vintage boutique joints. And I saw them and I was like, the, yeah. I saw them and I was like, you know what? Uh, let me get my first pair. And it was like a win-win situation because I'm supporting the homie and I'm, you know, I finally have a, a pair to call my own. I don't think there was ever really a deep yearning for uh, the sneaker for me. 
but I, you know, I always thought the concept was cool. I guess recently in terms of like my life as a whole for sure uh, recently I have come to terms with anxiety oh damn knocking everything over um, and what does that mean to me I think in terms of my life as a whole um, it has been recent because it was in the past two three years that it was just like oh therapist oh yeah you just have anxiety and that in and of itself was I said really eye-opening because it kind of like puts a face on I don't, I don't necessarily want to say enemy but like it puts a face on the thing and once you're able to like know what a thing is you can deal with a thing right prior to that it was just like this vague feeling notion of like doom right but once i'm able to essentially externalize or separate it from myself it's like oh this is what's happening right and not to say that like it's been easy i don't think it ever gets easy but it's like it's just like a manageable thing now where there have been moments that would have set me back weeks if I didn't have like, you know, the knowledge and experience I do now, but now that I have it, it's just like, okay, I understand what's happening right now. I'll manage that with the ways I know how to manage it. And, you know, it's easier to move forward. Um, but yeah, definitely knowing, knowing your, your enemy is like <laughs> half the battle, right? Cause that, that was, that was, very vital information for sure. Describing what anxiety is like is tricky because it's, uh, it, yeah, it's definitely not a cookie cutter thing, but like it's different for everybody, but like it just, it shows itself in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes it's just like general, like, say i'm leaving the house i lock my door i get in my car i've been driving for five minutes sudden intense feeling of i haven't locked my door somebody's gonna break into my house and steal all of my things it's insane it doesn't make any sense right that's just general anxiety right you feed yourself lies that you believe right it's it's just your brain making up stories um and not for you know not for no reason like anxiety exists in us because it had a practical function at some point in time in human history right you know the people that were always on alert back when we was hunter and gatherers were more likely to survive right but how does that how does that hold up in a context where we sit in air-conditioned buildings all day right so you need to um <laughs> understand how it like presents itself in yourself uh to actually work on it and one of the things that i learned pretty recently in the past couple of months that was actually very interesting is like uh, we as people have lost a certain thing that we we used to do so human thoughts and feelings and emotions the way we're supposed to kind of like work through those is by doing not necessarily manual labor but by doing something where you're not actively thinking so farming gardening yada yada something that like involves your hands but that isn't like 
taking your mental faculties away and it, it lets you process all the things you've you, you've been feeling process all your emotions but you know nowadays I, personally i'm on tiktok for mad long so you're never really getting a chance to like flush your brain out um and that's something we all have to do otherwise you get messed up you get backed up um but it's hard because it's it's easy to get on your phone it's easy to like watch endless tv it's easy to watch like endless netflix so it's asking a lot of people to get out of their comfort area get out of their comfort zones but to live a life that's better for you i mean you don't really have a choice of advice I would give somebody that has just recently discovered that they're dealing with anxiety is definitely like the, the piece of advice my therapist at the time told me um, you want to put faces on the things uh, you want to think of your consciousness as a vehicle right and at any given moment you could be driving or someone else could be driving or something else, however you want to name the thing, right? Um, and from, damn, that got shiny. Um, and for me, I just made it a little bit comical because, you know, life's kind of silly. So when I think of the car, the whatever, the vehicle of my consciousness, like I want to be at, behind the wheel, but you know, sometimes somebody else something else so one of the faces i gave uh my anxiety or how it presents itself just to make it goofy is you know that meme with evil kermit one of the one of the things is like oh evil kermit's driving so you got to realize okay this is happening right these things that i'm telling myself are not me i don't feel that way or that's not really what's happening or you know you just got to realize that like this is a lie and the lie is maybe maybe it's trying to protect you you got to think about like why are you telling yourself that why is this story um why is your brain telling you this story to help you survive you got to think about that but at the same time realize like you know you want to take back the wheel <laughs> otherwise you will just drive in circles over and over So, I guess to boil that back down is give a face or a name to that thing that's telling you that this is scary or this is a problem. And then when you give it a face, you can know when it comes up. And when you know when it comes up, you can find ways to deal with that thing. Oh, get the. say just whenever I'm in a situation where I'm not necessarily comfortable not to say that I'm like not comfortable right now I always have to be doing something with my hands so I say I'm at like a restaurant on a first date or something like that I'll get the the straw they give you for your the paper they give you with your straw I'm always gonna be folding that shit or I'm always gonna be doing doing something with my hands so like this is very uh, cathartic or relaxing So I switched to the other shoe. As someone who 
deals or manages anxiety? What are my expect expectations from friends or family? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, like the amount of people I've told, like in a serious sense, that like, hey, this is a thing I deal with, is pretty small. Um, I don't know if it's a character flaw or not, but you know, I typically tend to internalize things. I don't, I don't like asking for help too much, which is, you know, I guess part of the problem. But just give that some thought, like, you know, at least with the people that I've confided in, I guess my expectations are that I can continue to con confide in pe th those people, right? So it's not, I'm never going to be asking anybody for like anything like very specific. It's just a matter of like, hey, we have this open line of communication. And I say open because it goes both ways, right? I will be there for you in the same sense that like I would, I would like them to be there for me, right? Um, and I think that, you know, that really covers it. It's just a matter of like. If I've opened up, then I trust you, essentially. You know what I mean? Uh, has there been any pushback of me confiding with people? No. Uh, again, because <laughs> that that actual circle is so small. And then like half the people in the circle are going through the same thing. <laughs> so it's like, we, we all know what's up. We know what kind of world we live in. So like, yeah, no. Nah. I've just been lucky to be surrounded by uh, extremely supportive and like good friends. So, you know, not everybody has that. <laughs> and you know, I'm grateful. I will say on a funnier note, uh, I'm Ethiopian. I don't know, you know that, but the audience doesn't know that, right? Um, the only, this is probably the only real pushback I've gotten, and it's kind of secondhand. This was when I was like still 25 or so, 24, 25 on my parents' insurance, so my doctor was a family friend. And I went in for my little annual checkup. <laughs> you know, everything was normal, I was just healthy. And then he asked a question that I was not expecting. He was like, hey, man, you going through anything? Any depression or anything like that? And I was like thinking about it. And before I like, could answer, he was like, ah, no, you're not. Ethiopian people don't get that, right? So I was just like, oh, all right, all right. That's the, that's the type of time we own. <laughs> so that's, the, that's really the only thing I can uh, think of <laughs> in terms of pushback. And it's, I don't know, it's funny. It's not funny. But it's funny. Uh, do I think it's important to keep uh, certain circles apart from each other? I like family and friends and things of that nature. Like you're saying, like who you tell what. I believe so because not everybody can be there the same way for you that you need them to be. Like me personally, and when it comes to family, I love my family. I love my parents, but I can't talk to them about a lot of the shit that happens in my life day to day because they won't get it they, they don't understand it's like a different world like i'm not gonna be talking to my dad about relationships because he got married when he was fucking 10 years younger than me and had a kid at 25. his world and my world are completely different um so like it doesn't make sense uh And then, you know, yeah, you just gotta be selective. Not everybody can be there for you in the same way. It just, it doesn't work like that. Or at least for me. <laughs> Let me not speak for the world. Uh, someone who keeps private about some things uh, in terms of you know, family and friends. 
uh, the balance I keep is definitely, I, I would say with my siblings. Um, my younger brother is only two years younger than me, but it's like, it feels like in the past couple of years or so, our bond is like deepened. So we're able to talk about, I would say everything. So it's like having a friend and family in the same person, you know, which is <laughs> what your brother should be, right? Hopefully, hopefully. So I, I would say in that way, so it's just like, you have this person, you know, him being two years younger than me, that has ex essentially experienced the same life as me for like half of our lives. So it's, it's easy to um, communicate certain things and for him to understand where a lot of things originated or, you know, things like that. So I would say that's the best balance. And then, you know, as far as my parents go, I want you to see how clean this is. <laughs> yeah, that's just gleaming. <laughs> that shot is clean. You know, as far as my parents go, I've been broaching more conversations with them or just like, you know, uh, trying to like slowly open up conversations. Like I made it at a, a, a point to, um, you know, every time I get off the phone with my mom, every time I get off the phone with my dad, just be like, hey, I, I love you, mom. I love you, dad. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, and not to say that that, that was never said before, but I've made it a personal thing to make sure it's set. Um, so maybe in the future that relationship changes with my parents, maybe it doesn't. Either way, you know, we all, you know, we all love each other, but the specific dynamics of the relationship, uh, if they change, cool. If they don't, cool. Have these shoes taken me where I would like to go? Taking me where I need to go. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I could attribute these shoes in particular to to what you know what my what I think my journey is. Maybe in a sense. Um, I like them. I think they're cool, but I don't think that that's necessarily something that's a part of my my specific journey as I see it. So, I, I mean, I would say no. They're just nice to have. <laughs> you know what I mean? As someone that has captured moments from Don't Mute DC mm -hmm. to Coachella to Mochella. What's one thing that you would say is important to the culture that a lot of people miss? Hmm. As someone that's uh, captured moments like you know, Coachella or Mochella and Don't Mute DC. You said, what's uh, what's something important about the culture that people miss? You know, that is a great question. And I just, in terms of like self-awareness, um, I've always felt a certain certain way about it because yeah i'm from pg i would say yeah, for, for sure i've lived here for the majority of my life um but i think i, I, I took with that whole experience like um where where do i fall am i a part of it am i a spectator you know i listened to go go in high school um but i never went to a go go 
So like for me, it's like it's always been about a certain level of honesty. Like, and I think that's like that's pretty important. Like you got to be honest on: Am I a part of it? Am I viewing it? Am I a spectator? Am I appropriating it? Like you got to be. I think honesty is the biggest thing. Like for me, it's like I was there and. I was using my skill set to capture the moment. Am I a part of the moment? In a sense, I, w I would let other people answer that. But just being honest, I thought it was a beautiful moment, and I wanted to use my skills to like make sure other people saw it. Was that my responsibility? Who knows, right? But. I think a lot of people just have to be honest about where they are in terms of anything. Like, if you want to be a part of the community, just, you know, say that. But are you a part of it? Who knows? I think that's for the community to say. But, yeah, I mean, you just got to be authentic. You know, real, recognize real. <laughs> like, I think, well, what's the importance of being a cinematographer and a photographer? Uh, I want to say that they just go hand in hand. There's a certain, uh, on the, yeah, there's a certain synchronicity that happens because the only difference between a cinematographer and a photographer is one of the images is moving. But you got to think about it the same way. Like every frame, one of my YouTube favorite YouTube channels is um, every frame a painting, and it's a guy that uh, essentially just dissects. Let's get that sound in there. <laughs> He's a guy that just dissects, uh, you know, movies. But again, the 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 name of the the channel every frame of painting is really how you should think of it like any any given still you take as a photographer should be should be beautiful you want it to be it doesn't always end up that way um, and then any scene you should any scene you shoot should be a painting like ideally anybody should be able to pause a scene that you shot and every screen grab should look good granted that's not gonna happen you can't you can't get perfection every time but like that that should be the goal and of course going back to what i said earlier that should fit in the context of the project whatever it may be right so it's just they they both go hand in hand the goal is to like capture a moment that could lead me into bigger opportunities where do I find my balance in terms of work and non-work and things of that nature not personal projects you know that's a great question because I have the comfort of having a job in production as my nine-to-five and that pays my bills that puts my food on my table so I don't necessarily have to shoot not personal projects I could, you know, subsist off of um, my nine to five. So uh, the balance, in a sense, comes more from fulfillment. So like the things I shoot for work are corporate, standard, cut and dry, you know. Uh, but if I don't shoot the things that I love to shoot that make me happy when I pick up a camera, it just creates like this negative feedback loop where the things in work become extremely draining because it's the same thing over and over it's it's uh mundane <laughs> like it's it's literally stick to the script because we have scripts so for me balance comes from uh, finding you know the reason why i picked up a camera in the first place right and 
this this whole this whole balance I have at the moment is going to come to a head because it's like where I can't have I don't know if I can have both so I'm going to have to give up something in that situation to get to another level um so the nine to five job you know pays the bills but like it's 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 comfort it's like if you're comfortable if i don't have to shoot that project on the weekend i might not do it right so i'm you know i've i've come to grips with that already so like i know that like there's gonna be a point where I'm gonna have to reshuffle the cards to get, you know, a new hand. Um, but for right now, I mean, I'm good. Like, I gotta take care of my dog. <laughs> so like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna change up too much quickly uh, or too quickly. But yeah, I know eventually, like, you can't, you can't change your situation unless you do something different. At times, do I wish the city had a stronger culture of production and production work? <sighs> I think so. At times, I do. Well, like I live in Baltimore, but I, you know, I gotta come to DC often. And I think it would be great. Like there would be more venues. There would be more projects. There would be more ways to like get your foot in the door in different places but at other times from like a, a more self-preservation mindset like since it doesn't that means there's more more of a piece of the pie for me to take you know at some point so yeah, it, it's a balance and I know where like the things are I know I can go to Atlanta like, I know where I can go to um you can go to LA, you can go to New York if you really want to like sink your teeth into like what that world is at large. So I think I think it's good. It would have been nice at like earlier stages where it's like there's this very established world that like you start from here and you go to here. Right. But I think I'm at a point now where it's just like I know what steps to take to do to like changed the situation i know where i would have to go i know what i would have to do you just gotta do it <laughs> this is a day in my shoes